Well, good morning. It is great to see you today, see all of your smiling faces. Let me see those smiling faces. Well, that's good. That's good. And uh, pray that you all had an amazing week and so glad that you are joining us this morning. I want to make sure and, and also offer my uh, encouragement for you to come and join us at the prayer and praise event tonight here at the church at 6 o'clock. If for some reason the weather would get worse and we would have to postpone or reschedule that, we will put out a call on one call that uh, hopefully you're on and you'll be alert of that. But as of right now, we're planning on that at 6. And uh, pray that you can join us and be with us. It's going to be a great night to be together. Well, when the church is functioning as it should be, what does it look like? What is the purpose of the church? And we need to remember that when I ask that question, that you and I are the ones that make up the church. It's not the brick and the mortar. It's, it's you and I that make up the church. And so when we ask that question, we ask ourselves, what are you doing to be the church that God wants the church to be? When the church is functioning correctly, the lost can come and hear the message of forgiveness, love, conversion that Jesus Christ offers to anyone. It is in the church that we can receive training and teaching for, for how we can become the people that God desires us to be. It is within the church that, that we use our God-given gifts and talents and abilities to serve one another and the world beyond when the church is functioning properly, the lost, those without a relationship to Jesus Christ, can hear about and receive the good news of Christ from those who make up the church. When the church is functioning correctly, the church of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. So for the next few weeks, we're going to look into and learn what God wants Sunlight Wesleyan to be, what God wants the entire church to be. It's just not enough that if we come to the building on Sunday mornings, if we fail to be the church God wants us to be. It's not enough that we sing the songs. It's not enough that we take communion. It's not enough that we give our offerings. It's not enough that we sit through the sermon. It's not enough that we come to church if we actually fail to be the church. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about that type of church God wants us to be. This morning, we're actually going to be looking at the idea of worship. Now, most people, when they hear the word worship, they automatically think about music. But that's not the case. So this morning, it's my prayer that when we leave this morning, we will have a little different understanding of worship than when you came in this morning. We're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture found in John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I would appreciate it if you would turn there with me. If you forgot your Bible, there are pew Bibles or you can watch on the screen or use your electronic device. But John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. Now the Apostle John tells us the, in the book of Revelation about a series of visions he was given. He saw into heaven's throne room and witnessed the glory of God seated on his throne. He saw Jesus appearing at times as a lamb slain for God's people, and at other times as a great conqueror, waging war and riding upon a white horse, followed by the armies of heaven. He saw strange images of beasts and dragons and bowls and trumpets, all signifying and symbolizing the huge struggle taking place between the forces of God and the forces of evil. He saw the end of earth's history when Satan is defeated and vanquished for all time. And he witnessed the new heavens and the new earth where God's people will live in happiness forever. And when John was shown this final scene of God's ultimate triumph and the joy of God's people, he was so overcome by emotion that he fell down at the feet of the angel who had been showing him all of this. And this is what he said in Revelation 22, 9. It says, but he said to me, the angel said to John, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. If we were to summarize the teaching of the Bible in just a few sentences, one of them would have to be that two-word sentence, worship God. 
The Bible presents God as the one who is worthy of worship and repeatedly calls us to give him our worship. Well, this morning we're going to discuss what is involved in the act of worship by looking at John 4, 19 through 24. In this passage, Jesus was talking to a woman from Samaria. And this woman asked Jesus to settle an argument about where people should worship. And instead, Jesus talked about the type of worship that pleases God. So look with me at John chapter 4, starting in verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, yet we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. This morning, I'd like to share two truths that I see in this passage. The foundation and the first truth is this. Jesus said, it's not just God that we are worshiping, it's the Father. Now, Father was the preferred name that Jesus used when talking about God. For instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said such things like, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We find that in Matthew 5. And then he also told us that your Father knows what you need before you ask him. He told us that in Matthew 6. And he promised that your Father in heaven will give good gifts to those who ask him. He told us that in Matthew 7. He taught us to pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, in Matthew 6, and promised that if we forgive others, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And there are many other examples, but these reveal that Jesus tended to call God Father when he was speaking about him. And here, when speaking with this Samaritan woman, Jesus used this Father language once again to talk about God in verse 23, where he says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, at first glance, this may not seem like such a big deal, especially to those who have grown up in the church for a while, because we've grown accustomed to hearing the word Father. We've, we've heard that for years and years and years. However, calling God Father in Jesus' time was a huge deal. It was even somewhat scandalous because it implied a closeness and a familiarity with God that the teachers of the law said was beyond our ability to experience. The teachers at that time said, we're temporal, God is eternal. We're weak, God is all-powerful. We're limited, God has no limits. And so the very idea that we could have a close relationship with God was was not an idea that they could even entertain. They couldn't even fathom that. And yet here was Jesus teaching us to call God Father. There's a lot of meaning packed into that word. And I recognize that many people have earthly fathers who have failed in a significant way. And so what I'm about to say may not be true for everyone here this morning. For many of us, though, when we think of Father, we think of such adjectives as provider, protector, fixer of what breaks, because that's what fathers do. They provide for their families. They protect them. They fix things around the house. They guide them. They direct them. And when we think of fathers, we think of men who are interested in our lives and our accomplishments. They burst with pride when we succeed. And seek to encourage us when we fail. And for many of us, fathers bring, Father brings to mind disciplinarians who helped us figure life out. Who corrected us when we needed it and set us on a path to have a good productive life. When Jesus speaks about God as Father, it's those types of activities he was underscoring about God. 
God is like the perfect father, Jesus was saying. Now, why does that matter? Why does it matter that we worship our father opposed to God? Well, it matters for the very reason that we just discussed. God is more to us than some all-powerful being. He is more than some eternal spirit. He is more than some all-knowing entity. He is more than the creator and king of the universe. Now, if that's all that we could say God was, that would still be plenty of reason to worship him. And we would still have reason to give that to him. But God is more than that. Not only is he an all-powerful God who created us, he's also our Father who cares about us, watches over us. Not only is he an all-knowing entity, he knows us totally, everything about us. He even knows our thoughts. He's our Father who loves us in spite of what he knows about us. And not only is he the king of the universe, but he is also our father who protects us and provides for us. And so the reality of who God is changes somewhat our motivation to worship. It's not just that we worship a king because he commands us to. We worship our father who cares for us. It's not that we just worship an all-powerful being who could force us to. We worship our Father who loves us and protects us. It's not just God we're worshiping, it's the Father with all that word entails. And when we reflect on it, on who it is we're worshiping, well, that really changes our view of worship from an activity that we have to do because God has commanded it to something we get to do because God loves us. And we want to thank him and honor him and praise him. So the first truth that we see in this passage is it's not just God that we're worshiping, it's the Father. The second truth is this. It's not the dressings of worship that are important. It's the attitude of the worshiper that matters. The woman in our passage mentions a debate between the Jews and the Samaritans that had been going on for hundreds of years. And that debate centered around the question of where the proper place was to worship God. The Jews said that the proper place to worship was in the temple in Jerusalem, while the Samaritans taught that God wanted to be worshipped on top of a mount, a mount Gerizim, a mountain in Samaria. And they were both hung up I'm call, on, on, on I'm calling the dressings of worship, the external, the outward signs of worship that we tend to think must be present in order for worship to occur. Things like a church building, singing songs, preachers preaching, and things like that. Now, those things are great. Don't get me wrong. But they aren't what makes worship, worship. In fact, you can have all these things and still not have worship. And conversely, you can have none of these things, no church building, no songs being sung, no sermon being preached, and still have worship. Let me give you an example. If I could dress like a doctor and put on a white coat, wear a stethoscope around my neck, and carry a medical chart in my hand, But if you were having a medical emergency right now, you would not want me to work on you. Why? Because I'm not a doctor. I haven't been to medical school. I don't have the right knowledge and the skill set. And dressing me up like a doctor is not going to make any difference in that. By the same token, we could have a doctor in the sanctuary this morning. Perhaps he or she is not dressed like a doctor. They aren't carrying a little black bag. They aren't dressed in a doctor's coat. And they're none of the things you expect to see when you see a doctor. And yet, if I were to have a medical emergency right now, that would be the person I would want to come help me. Even though they don't look like what I would expect a doctor to look like. Why? Well, because they are a doctor. Even if their clothes and their appearance aren't what I would expect, they have the right knowledge and skill set, even if they aren't wearing doctor's clothes. And in the same way, it's not the dressings of worship that make worship. 
the church building, the songs, the sermon. There's, there's something more than that which is necessary in order for worship to take place. Now, the Jews and Samaritans were hung up on issues involving the dressing of worship. They were arguing over the proper place at which worship should occur. And Jesus said they were both wrong. He said, a time is coming when you, will not, when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. And Jesus was right because within a short period of time, Roman armies would put an end to the formal worship of God in both of those places. And Jesus understood that it's not the place that makes the worship. It's not the dressings of worship that are really important. To Jesus, the place we worship God was not the important thing. He refused to get into the debate about whether we should worship in Jerusalem or in Gerizim. These things with which we dress up worship, the building, the order of service, the things such as that, those aren't the important things. For Jesus is not the place that makes the worship. It's not these dressings of worship. Rather, it's the attitude of the worshiper. I, I hope you know that I believe we have a first-class praise team here. They, they are just so talented and so gifted, and each and every week they lead us in songs as we come into worship, as we come into this sanctuary. But you know what? It doesn't matter how good they are. If we come in with a rotten attitude... If we come in with a heart that is not set to ask God to speak to us, it, it doesn't matter if they have 55 gold records. It's not going to happen for you to worship. Now, you have to understand, I love music. I, I absolutely love music. And music is something to me that helps add in my encounter of worship. But if you don't have the attitude that you need to have, it doesn't matter how special the music is. It doesn't matter how ornate the building is. Worship has to start within us. It can't start in a place or in a music. Jesus said that true worshipers would worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And this phrase means worshiping God in sincerity and honesty. It's to humbly come before him, offering him our praise and adoration for all he is and all he has done. And recognize our dependence upon him for our life, for our salvation, for absolutely everything. Worshiping in spirit and truth means that our attitude is right before God. We come into a church building and our worship will still be wrong if it's not sincere and honest. God is not interested in lip service worship, even if it's done in a church building. He doesn't want us to sing songs or pray prayers while our minds are on other things. He doesn't want us to take communion when our thoughts aren't centered on Jesus and our sin for which we've suffered. God isn't interested in our sitting politely while the preacher preaches when our mind is a million miles away. And that's an important question to ask ourselves. When we come in to worship, when we come in to worship the Father, are our thoughts and our minds on him? Or are they on what has happened in the past week? Because if they're on the things of the past week, if they're any other place except on him, then our worship is not pleasing to him. In the same way, this means that I can worship God even when I am not in a church building means that I can worship God even if my singing voice isn't all that great. It means that I can worship God whether I am with other people or all by myself. Because our worship is not confined to this building. We can, and in fact should say, worship God daily. You know, we come together on a Sunday morning and we worship God here. But you know, Carl Clark worships God throughout the week 
in a little confined space in a semi that he drives down the road. He doesn't have to be here. Now, I'm glad he's here, but he doesn't have to be here to have worship. We don't have to be here to have worship, although later on in the Bible it says we should meet together, so I don't want you to think, well, we don't need to go to church. We'll just stay home. I don't want you to do that because worship is something that takes place individually for us, but it also takes place corporately for all of us. You see, we worship God any time we pause to reflect on how wonderful he is and offer him our praise. Every time we sing a song praising him and really mean it, whether in the church building or not, we are worshiping. Every time we thank him for how amazing he is to us, we are worshiping. Every time we read his word and draw near to him with hearts open to hear what he has to say, we are worshiping him. Because we are saying to him that he is important enough to draw near to. Worship is not a Sunday morning activity only. Any more than it was a temple or a Mount Gerizim activity only. Worship is about honoring God with all of our lives, all of the time. And worship should take place every day. Because God is good every day. When we save worship for Sunday, when we make worship something that can only occur within the walls of this building, we are falling into the same trap that the Samaritans and the Jews were snared in. And Jesus said, don't be like that. Worship the Father in spirit and truth. Worship is not tied to a building. Worship is not tied to an event. Rather, worship is tied to a thankful and sincere attitude of praise and thanksgiving that acknowledges God's greatness and majesty. Worship God. The church, if it is functioning as it should be, is a church of worship. It's a place of worship. But as you remember when we talked about this at the very beginning, you and I make up the church And so if we come together on a Sunday morning and we worship as a church, that's all of us coming together. But when we leave on Sunday morning and go throughout our work week, go throughout our homes, that same worship goes with you wherever you go. It doesn't stop once you walk out the door. Worship does not stop at the last note that the praise team plays. Worship continues in our lives every moment of every day. That's what the church is like when it's working correctly. So I encourage you. Hopefully, as you've come this morning, you you have a little different idea of what worship is. And it gives you a little better understanding of how we are to worship God each and every day. And it's not just a place. It's not just a thing but it's something that we do and we are glad to do it to be able to worship him. Would you stand with me, please? Lord, the worship that we talk about this morning is an attitude. It's an attitude of our hearts, mine and yours. And so, Lord, when we, when we get ready on a Sunday morning and we say we're going to go to church, I pray that each and every one of us would say, okay, Lord, what is my attitude? I need to make sure my attitude is right in order to go to church and worship with other other Christians. Meaning that when we come into the sanctuary and we come to worship, that it's all about you, Lord. The song that we sang earlier, sorry, Lord, for all the things that we've made it, but it's all about you. It's all about you. And so, Lord, help us to realize that worship is not about a lot of things that in our mind may say that that's what it is. But help us to realize that worship is all about giving ourselves to you, praising you, 
And Lord, help us to do that. We ask, Lord, that you would help the church, sunlight, to be a church of worship where each and every person is worshiping you every moment of the day. And we bring that all back together on a Saturday or on a Sunday, and we just worship you. Lord, we thank you for this lesson this morning. Just ask that you would just continue to speak to us throughout this week to come. And Lord, that our worship would be pleasing to you. And we ask these things in your name. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 You are dismissed. Have a great week. God bless.